I'm going to ask you a trap question. You can fall for it if you want. Who here, by a show of hands, would say that they love? You love God, you love others. That's everybody. We love. And if we love, there are many things that we do in love. And you do those things, right? For example, we love and we understand that love forgets. Love forgives. Love befriends. Love cares. Love comforts and love embraces. Love appreciates. Love conquers. Love shares. Even when we don't want to. Love sacrifices. Can I get an amen from the parents in the room? And love does a number of things that are not listed today. So I'll ask you to ask yourself, how are you doing? How are you doing? Just based on that list, how are you doing in the area of showing love, of loving? Oh, there's one I left out. Got one more for you. Love gives. Love gives. This is the part where you can walk out and chance being tripped. In our last sermon series, we, we mentioned several times in the after, about the afterlife of God's love. As a matter of fact, we even referenced John 3.16, a popular, one of the sometimes most common verses that we learn early in age, that for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him, they'll not perish, but they'll in fact have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he what? He gave. For God so loved the world that he gave. In fact, I would argue right out the gate today that you are never, you can never be more like God than when you give. The most important text potentially in scripture is that he loved us so much that he gave. And thank God for it. Amen? He loved us so much that he gave. Love gives and nothing expresses your love like giving. When you decide to give. Maybe even sacrificially. Let me give you a couple of examples. As you think of things maybe you love. I love bacon. Come on, somebody better preach in the Lord's house today. I love some crispy, don't give me the, yeah, 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 yeah. I don't want the floppy bacon. I, give me the crispy bacon. Ooh, some of y'all are ready to eat, but y'all y'all expecting me to bring bacon in right now, aren't you? I actually thought about it. I'm not going to lie. I actually thought about it. Man, that would have won me some points, wouldn't it? I love bacon. And I can stand here and try to express my bacon love to you, but I've got a video of a commercial from 1989 that will show it best. Take a look. Bacon, bacon, where's the bacon? I smell bacon, bacon, bacon. Gotta be bacon, only one thing smells like bacon. That's bacon. Bacon, 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 bacon. There, from that bag, what's it say? I can't read. Please, please, give me what's in the bag. Chewy, yummy, smoky bacon. There you go. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, no, 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 no. It's bacon. We were talking about this a few weeks ago in my home, and my kids didn't have a clue what I was talking about because I, we were eating bacon, and I was like, bacon! And they both looked at me, and I was like, you guys weren't around in the late 80s, right? And I have to say, I, I didn't even remember. It was 1989. I had to look it up. But a 1989 commercial of a, of a dog thinking he's getting bacon, and we love bacon, it's bacon. Well, uh, it turns out my entire family loves bacon, 
especially Charlie. And bacon's not cheap. It's going up in price. I'm about to get some more amens. And he wants to eat a whole pack. And I'm like, brother, you got to get a job just to support your bacon habit. So this week, my wife decided, uh, Tuesday night or some night, she decided to cook pancakes with bacon for dinner. <laughs> my Lord, I feel the Lord moving already. She cooked pancakes with bacon, and she was, we like to do that for dinner sometimes. Anybody else like breakfast for dinner? That's good stuff, right? So we all go sit at the table together, and I was the last one to get to the, to the table, the dining room table. Yeah, poor me. That's right, Irene. And I sit down, and there's a plate, which is my plate, and it has three slices of bacon on it. And I was like, whew, they saved me some. That's my good wife. And I looked over at Charlie's plate, and he had zero bacon. And Mitzi goes on to tell me, hey, we were waiting for you, and the pancakes were getting cold, so we decided to pray and start eating. Totally fine. I was busy doing something. I get it. And I look over, and I said, Charlie, where's your bacon? Well, I've already eaten it. And Mitzi looks at me, and she's like, he's had enough. He had like five or six pieces. I don't know. Big, long slices of bacon. So in that moment, I stopped, and I looked at my bacon, and I had three slices, and I picked one up, and I laid it on Charlie's plate. And he got so excited. I was the best dad ever. Because you see, I love bacon, but I love Charlie more than I love bacon. So I give. I give because love gives. It sacrifices. I wanted that bacon. But love gives. Yesterday, our neighborhood had a community yard sale. You know, they advertise it, and everybody, you can put out and sell stuff if you want to, and it's a big deal. And matter of fact, I don't think we've ever been home during one of them because we usually have baseball or something, and we didn't. We had nothing Saturday. It was kind of nice, and so the weather was perfect. People were yard selling all throughout the neighborhood, and um, we decided not to participate in the yard sale. We just were not yard sellers, really. We, I'm just telling you, we usually give stuff away. And so, uh, so we, we, didn't, we didn't participate in the yard sale, but my kids decided with the neighbor's kids they wanted to do a lemonade stand because they're, they got to support their bacon habit. And so... They go outside with some of the neighbors, and uh, they decided to set up a lemonade stand, and my daughter had made some bracelets, and she was trying to sell those, and I don't even know if they made any money. Um, the tithe report will tell us. I hope. And so uh, Tina and Randy happened to be wheeling and dealing through our neighborhood. Tina. Tina was wheeling and dealing. I saw Randy, he was just carrying stuff and loading the car down. He was the muscle behind the operation. But uh, they came by the house, and, and Tina walks in, and we're in there talking to Tina in the house. And, uh, and then Randy, come, Randy was out by the road, and he comes walking in. He's carrying a cup of lemonade. And I was like, <laughs> they got you. I said, Randy, you bought some lemonade. And he looked at me and he said, no, I didn't. He said, Charlie gave it to me. <laughs> and then he looked at him and said, this is your church discount. <laughs> Love gives. Even kids see that. Kids see that, hey, when you love, you give. And you often give to those you love. Charlie loves people. He loves his church. He loves his, and he even made a joke about this is the church. He associated Mr. Randy with church. And we love our church and God teaches us love because he is love and love gives. And Charlie's as tight as his dad is. He don't want to give anything away when he's got the potential to take Randy's money. Because you love, you give. 
Because you love a lot, many times we want to give more. But sometimes we feel like we can't give more. You feel you can't because you believe you don't have enough. And the truth is, many times, it's not a money problem. It's a mindset problem. So today, I'm going to ask God through the next few moments, as I share from his word, to help change your mindset, not your money problem. I may not be talking to anyone specifically in this service today, but I'm sharing what God's given me to give to the church today. And maybe everyone here is faithful in their service of giving to the Lord, as Scripture tells us to. That's between you and the Lord. I'm not here because the church needs money. We don't operate a business here of funneling money in and out or collecting it or sitting on it. We don't do that. We do it for the purpose of doing ministry to see lives changed by the goodness, glory, grace, and love of Jesus Christ. And it's only possible in the form that we have taken on to do it when people give. Okay? So I'm not preaching at you today, as I often say. I'm not fundraising today. If I needed money, I'd ask you for money. I'm not afraid. I'm not doing that today. I'm doing this to better you with your relationship with the Lord today. It's the only reason. The only reason. We've got great people that support this church. And it takes it. We, we do things well here. We do things fun here. We take care of others and we support others and we give and give and give. I'm glad the air conditioner is working today. Anybody else? I'm glad we have lights. My brother, my oldest brother, just got back from the Bahamas this week. He spent like 10 days there rebuilding a church, I think, that maybe had been destroyed by a storm. People have, they have barely anything. And we, we've been there. I've done that, right? We, we, we're involved in missions, but it just makes me think, man, I'm so thankful for what we have. I, I was joking with my wife this week. I said, I feel like we need to start a, a peppermint budget. Some of you feel like you need to give to the peppermint budget. God convict them right now. But seriously, we, we, we give peppermints every Sunday. I know that's small. Those things are like $12 or $13 a container. They are not cheap. I'm not complaining. I'm glad we can do that. We spend hundreds of dollars a year on peppermints. And it's all Jack's fault. He's going to blame me because I preach so long. And that's how he tells the time. But I'm thankful we can do that. So hear my heart today. I'm your pastor. You know me. Hear my heart as we share God's word today. All right? 2 Corinthians chapter 8. We're going to jump into 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Paul. Paul is a Jew. Paul gets saved. God calls Paul to be a minister of the gospel not just to the Jews, but as well to the Gentiles. And Paul ministers and he starts churches and he specifically in this moment is talking to the Macedon or dealing with the Macedonian church. And he has challenged the Macedonian church to be givers, to be generous, which is an interesting, interesting concept. So he's blown away by their irrational generosity, much like I am with my church. I get blown away by your irrational generosity. So I feel like I'm kind of preaching in some ways to the Macedonians this morning. He's blown away by their response. He goes to the church in Corinth and says, hey, let me tell you what the Macedonians are doing. Boy, that's encouraging, right? You go to the church down the street. Let me tell you what this other church is doing. You should be more like them. I bet that came across real good. And then it was about finances. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Listen. 
And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst, listen, 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 in the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. <laughs> That's so wild. Verse 3. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability. Entirely on their own. They urgently pleaded with us. They begged us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. And they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord and then by the will of God also to us. So we urged Titus, just as he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. But since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love we have kindled in you. Because you love, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. May God add his blessing to his word. Throughout chapters 8 and 9 here in 2 Corinthians, Paul speaks about the significance of of giving he encourages generosity in the church as a matter of fact in chapter 9 he says these words he says whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly and whoever sows generously will also reap generously and then he goes on into the words of God loves a cheerful giver as you've heard me say many times in our text today, he uses the Macedonian churches as an example of faithful and willing givers. And if you don't know much about the Macedonian churches, we're given a little bit here, but I want to tell you a couple of things about them. First of all, they were very poor but irrationally generous. Very poor. Matter of fact, when the Bible explains their extreme poverty, it literally means it was as deep as the ocean. Their poverty level was as deep as the ocean. These people were hurting financially and yet they found it in their hearts through love to be irrational givers. Second, they were enduring trials and yet they were overflowing with joy. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? They are really in difficult times of poverty and suffering and yet they are generous and joyful they found love through giving now when I think about people today and I'm speaking generally about people today who are going through difficult financial situations and just can't catch a break because it's trial after trial after trial they don't typically respond in here in America in 2024 with generosity and joy me included that's not our typical response when we see that the bills can't be paid or the money's running out at the end of the month and we just can't get ahead because then the car tore up and more things happened the kids were begging for bacon and it was seven dollars a pack and we just didn't have it that month the last thing we feel there is more generosity. The last thing we feel there is to be joyful. In fact, we probably become depressed at that moment. We become anxious. We, we become angry and we selfishly protect what we do have, right? So how were the Macedonians so generous and joyful during this season of poverty and suffering? They had a different mindset. It was different from our mindset. And I'm going, to, I'm going to offer two mindsets today when it comes to money. 
Number one, there's the bag mindset, and then there's the barn mindset. The bag mindset is that we don't have enough. All I have is what's in this bag, and this is it, and, and I don't have enough. So, a matter of fact, in Haggai 1 and 6, Haggai says it this way. You have planted much, but harvested little. Anybody ever work your fingers to the bone and just feel like you got nothing for it in return? You, you, you eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but you are not warm. You earn wages only to put them, listen, in a purse or a bag with holes in it. It's like your finance bag has holes in it and at the end of every month that you're living by every month to month, you, you get to this place where there's nothing left in the bag. I want to give to God's church. I want to do what's right. I want to follow his word because love gives. I want to help those in need, but hey, I'm in need myself. I don't have enough. If I had more, I would give more. That's the bag mindset. Here's the second mindset. It's the barn mindset. The barn mindset says, says we have enough. In fact, we probably have more than enough. We have enough to give to others. Deuteronomy 28 and 8 promises, the Lord will send a blessing on your barns and on everything you put your hand to. The Lord your God will bless you in the land he is giving you. The, the, the barn mindset here is that we will have enough because God will take care of us. It's not a message of prosperity. It's just a promise that if love gives and we love through giving, our life will be different because God will provide. This is how the Macedonians lived. They didn't have very much, but they also didn't have a bag mindset. They had a barn mindset. They believed that God would take care of them. They didn't wait until they had more. They actually said, hey, we're going to give right now. So what happens when we have this bag mindset? Well, here's what happens. God gives you something. You get paid. You earn a wage. Or he blesses you in some way. He supplies what you need. And the first thing we do with the bag mindset is we consume. We consume. This week's the first of the month. Maybe some of you are getting paid this week. Either by your job or the government or both. You're getting your money this week. God's going to supply for you this week. And what's the first thing most of us are going to do? We're going to pay our bills. I hope. Pay our bills for things that we are consumers of. Oh, I'm going to pay that Netflix payment because I got some TV to watch, even if God doesn't get his. I don't have Netflix, by the way. Uh, I, we're going to go out to eat. We're going to go buy groceries. We're going to consume. We're going to pay for the things we need. We're going to click buy now on Amazon. We've had things sitting in our cart until the first of the month so we can afford it. We consume, and then at the end of the pay period, we don't have enough. Well, if I'd have had enough, I would have given a little bit to those in need or to the church. But, but I, I, I didn't have enough because I had these other things I had to take care of first. And then fear sets in, discomfort, financial frustrations. We can never get ahead. We, we love and we want to give because love gives. However, we just... We don't have enough for ourselves, much less to give to others, and that's a mindset problem. Because you give first. And why do you give first? Because love gives. The barn mindset gives first. As a matter of fact, in Proverbs, in Pro Proverbs chapter 3, it says, Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. The, the first thing you, you do if you have the barn mindset is you give because love gives. 
You honor God with the very first of what he entrusts to you. And we typically refer to that as tithing. Giving the first fruit. The very first thing we should do when God blesses us is take it and honor him through giving. The very first thing. Now, Scripture refers to this as 10%. If you got questions about all this, come see me afterwards. I'll lay it out for you. Scripture refers to this as 10%. And some of you might be thinking, man, I just, I, there's no way. I do a budget. I got a spreadsheet. There is absolutely no, I can give 3%. But to do 10%, I would have to change some things. <laughs> that's, a, that's a reality for some people's mindset. I would hate for someone to have to put God first in their life. And actually do what his word has called us to do. Many times we have tithe envelopes. We have offering envelopes that we have in the back of the pew. That's just a way for you to itemize what you're giving if you choose to. And at the bottom it has Malachi 3 and 10. And Malachi 3 and 10 says, Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And, and the only time that God says this in Scripture, test me in this says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. Test God in this. I've shared this before, but it's been a few years ago, and this just hit me, and Lord, I probably shouldn't do this, but you gave it to me. I remember having a pastor growing up in my church when I was a late teenager, and he would preach on giving sometimes. And I'll never forget Dr. Wayne Doherty is his name. I still talk to him from time to time. And he would preach on giving. And I attended a large church, six, 700 people, my home church. And he would preach on giving. And he would stand up there. And boy, you talk about boldness, courage, maybe a little stupidity. He would stand up there and he would preach on giving and the, the act of tithing and how God's called us to do this. And he would say to that congregation, I'll never forget it. You give God, you test God. God says to test me. Test God. Test drive this thing for six months. Give 10% of what your earnings are. And if God doesn't bless the 90% more than the 100%, We'll write you a check and give you every dollar back that you gave to the church over the last six months. If you come to us and say, hey, God failed me. He let me down. I trusted it to him. I put it in the plate. I've not been able to make it since then. So I'll challenge you today. Linda, don't look at me like that. She's the treasurer. If you're not a tither, you're not a faithful giver, test God. And in six months or three months, whenever you feel like you've hit the bottom, you come back to me and we'll write you a check. Can we do that? We'll write you a check. We'll give you every dime back you, you gave. We'll do it. Test him. See, won't he do it? You'll live so much more comfortably with that 90% because you chose to honor God with your first fruits. I know that's not easy. I know that's difficult. That mindset seems crazy. But it requires faith and trust. Because many times we think we can just make it on our own. But everything we have is from him above. You've earned nothing on your own. And I promise you God will bless you more if you are faithful 
in giving to his church. I don't want us just to rearrange our lives and prioritize giving through offering and tithe. God calls us to be good stewards of our resources as well, our time, our energy, our efforts, how we physically give to the church in service to him. You see, giving breaks the bag mindset. Whenever God supplies, the first thing we do is we give back to him. And you cannot wait until you have more money to decide to be generous and follow God's instructions to give. I've heard people say to me directly before, Pastor, if I just had more, I would give more. No, if you had more, you'd just be more of the person you are today. And if that's a selfish person, you'll just be more selfish. And if that's a generous person, then you'll be more extremely generous than you were before. It's not going to change your mindset. Your mind is made up. Paul tells the Macedonian church, Philip, you can come. Paul tells the Macedonian church, tells us that the Macedonian church urgently pleaded with him to give to God's people. Listen to that for a moment. They urgently pleaded with him for opportunities to give. I'm so thankful we have people here today that love to give. And they give because they love. This afternoon, your local church board is going to have a meeting in about two and a half hours next door. And I'm going to be leading this meeting, and we've got an agenda of a few things we're going to cover. Just a few, because one of them is a really big topic. And that is setting forth the budget for the next fiscal year. That's fun. That's as fun as it sounds. And we will, over the course of a few minutes or hours, we will, I'm not kidding, we will go through every line item in the church's budget. We will look at what was spent, what was given, and what we can look to spend in the next year, what we can look to do through ministry. Every dollar has a name. It's assigned to something. And it sure isn't a rainy day fund we're prepared for a rainy day but we believe in putting money back into ministry immediately if we can and I'm excited about some of the things that we're going to talk about today for the new year as a matter of fact we're, we're starting new budget lines because God has provided and now we can do new ministry and new things to further his kingdom and benefit his church. Here's the greatest blessing for this pastor, knowing that this annual agenda item is popping up today. I'm not stressed, I'm not worried, and I'm not burdened by this topic or the agenda that lies ahead. Why? Because I have the joy of pastoring people who love and love gives. I pastor people who urgently plead for opportunities to invest, not just monetarily, but in other ways. How can we help? Because that's what God's called us to do. And even when we don't have much and maybe we can't even get ahead, we're Macedonians. And Macedonians give, and they trust God through it. Earlier this week, we laid our brother Junior to rest. Thank you so much for everybody that was able to come and be a part of that. It's a great turnout. And before I even knew it, I received a text message from a family in our church this week. And they they said to me, Pastor, we understand that, that Junior may have some unpaid 
funeral expenses. It was kind of news to me. I was like, okay. And then I ended up talking to Linda, our treasurer, and she verified this. And this family said, hey, we want to help. Can you swing by and get a check? We want to give towards this. They, they pleaded. And it was urgent. They said, can you stop by in the morning? I said, yeah, I'll be there mid-morning. I'll be there. They pleaded. And they were urgent. Not even knowing what I was preaching on today. Maybe not even acknowledging and realizing the scriptures that we will read today. They pleaded and with urgency said, we've got to give towards this. And help our brother. Because we're the church and we love and love gives. Turns out there wasn't a need. God had taken care of the expenses already. I don't know, I don't know the details, but it was taken care of. And so I reached, being a good pastor, I'm not trying to take people's money. I reached back out to this family and I said, hey, I want you to know in all transparency, this has been taken care of. We can give you this check back or we can tear it up. Or you tell me what to do with it. And the response was, no, no, you just keep it. There will be other needs. And love gives. That's a barn mindset. That's not a bag. That's not a family that's got holes in their bag. That's, it's just leaking everywhere. They understand truth. They understand that this is my Jehovah Jireh, my provider that I'm serving. And I will, he has supplied all my needs to this point and I will be faithful to give to him and to his church and to his people first. And then on top of that, I'm gonna urgently plead for opportunities to make a difference. Even if I have to do without. Because it's not about me. It's about Him and honoring Him with our tithe and going above and beyond with our offering. Because we love, and when we love, we give. And because you give, you're able to live a full and joyful life. Let me tell you, as you stand this morning, why were the Macedonians, I said it earlier, why were the Macedonians joyful? Why were they full of life? Why were they able to live this life that they lived with joy and excitement. I answered it earlier because they had a barn mindset. They had a different mindset. And the reality is they were so joyful. They were so full of life, Pastor Jack, because they loved and they understood that love gives. Does it sacrifice? Yes. Does it protect? Yes. Does love embrace and care and comfort? Yes. Love does all those things you can think about. But it also gives, and I say again, I don't know that we can be any more like the Lord than when we realize that we need to be givers as well in all things and doing it first making it a priority and a part of who we are and I promise you if you do you will live the most full and joyful life that you've, that you've ever experienced test him and see